So because of the problem here, we're looking for a sponsor. So if you know somebody that wants to sponsor us, could be in food, could be uh, in cash to make food possible, please reach out to me because it would be much appreciated. And of course, patients. People who have visited more often do uh, know that we have patients at the end of the meetup, and there you can share in one minute uh, an ID, a project you're working on, anything food and blockchain related. So for now, think over if you want to pitch something, and then you can reach out to me during the break, and we'll put you in the lineup. And speaking about people joining us for the first time, let's do a quick show of hands. Who's here for the first time today? Ah, about half. And who has been here more than, let's say, five times? Ah, a couple of diaries here, because this is already the 17th meetup, so oh, we're acting for more than a year now. Uh, next point I'm getting to is collecting emails. You might have noticed that uh, at the text text that there is a computer that's collecting your emails, and of course, blockchain, data, privacy, they're all very tricky subjects. We talked about those last meetup when we talked about the blockchain of Amsterdam, but we're not collecting them to share them around with everybody on Facebook. We're collecting them because we just have a new newsletter and we really want to share the newsletter with you. Uh, and therefore, we of course need your email. So if you're interested in the newsletter, listen to Rafael, who's going to talk to you more about it, and share your email with us. Hello everyone, my name is Rafa Littlestar <laughs> and I also work at the Fork as a growth hacker and since shortly I'm also responsible for the newsletter. So I don't know if anyone already received the first newsletter. Can I see some hands? How did you guys like it? Great. Was it interesting? So what we do right now in the newsletter is one section about the last meetup, one part about blockchain for supply chains news, in which we uh, look for three very interesting articles for you and uh, explain a bit about it so you can stay up to date and um, we also talk about expectations for the next meetup. So it's basically a great way to stay up to date with the blockchain for supply chain sector. And my question for you guys today is, is there anything you would like to see in a newsletter like this? What would be of value for that? Is there any idea that pops up? Well, if you have any idea, please come to me. And no one cares? <laughs> Yeah. Well, looking forward instead of looking backwards. So the sessions behind us, but the ones who are coming have to be. In oh, yes. I didn't explain it clearly, maybe. But the, the third section of the newsletter is expectations for the next newsletter. No? Oh, I clearly haven't read it. <laughs> you Sorry. will. Sorry. Don't worry. All right. Well, we're trying to give value to anyone. So if you have an idea, come to me. Thank you. Well, while you think over um, what you want to be shared to the media, maybe you can send it to work code, you can say you can also join uh, the newsletter. And we have actually had some really good, um, uh, good feedback on the newsletter. I think it was much appreciated uh, so far. Yeah, I'm breaking a bit, but I didn't create it, so I think I can do that. Um, so please join us. And I now want to invite Yoko on stage, because Yoko is our case master. Oh, wait, wait. Sorry, a quick uh, 2019, because of course our time with Unity almost is to an end because um, we, we are following the Unity case for a whole year. Uh, and then the final uh, check in with our case will be December 11th, our next meetup. And December 11th will also be the time to vote because then we will present uh, the possibilities for new use cases. Those who will follow for a half a year. Uh, and if you have a case, a blockchain and food case that you want to pitch, please send an email to us, hide the form of online again, and maybe you will be the next use case. And if you're a bit puzzled because you're here for the first time, what's the use case? Why are we following him? Well, I'm giving over the word to Yoko, who's going to show what a typical check in with Unity looks like, and she will present the Unity and the learnings. And I think help this time by blue down, right? Mark, Mark, you are. Thank you. Run um, the process. This is up. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Hello. Is this is this okay? Okay. Perfect. Um, okay. So my name is Jo Kroek, and I'm here 
indeed for the, I don't know, ninth time, and that's due to the reason that uh, Ford has chosen a uh, adapt our own case philosophy. And for the ones who are new, which is quite some, I will do a little explanation. Instead of inviting each and every month a new company or a new initiative explaining the what's in the house and elaborate further on that, we decided it could be an interesting idea to choose one company and follow this throughout the year. For the 19, 2019 exercise, it will be half a year. Uh, but the principle is the same. It's one institute, one company, one initiative, and there will be a deep dive around themes every month. So it means that if you're interested in this one, or you're volunteer as a company, you could have a, uh, uh, well, a, a review of your business and Q&Rs around a certain theme, which can be very attractive. Um, so we've chosen in February for equity, and uh, I'll do a little bit of explanation from uh, of the company. Equity is a um, e-commerce digital platform, um, communication e-commerce, and it has a proposition for smallholders in mostly developing countries. Uh, you can imagine smallholders, about 800 million people live around a, a low income area and uh, mainly uh, smallholders or farmers are, um, are in, that, in that same field. Um, the idea behind it is that a smallholder and the cooperative they are working with um, get a smartphone, a, a, a well, a mobile phone with a platform on, on it and with the platform they are able to increase their efficiency of their business, mainly food agriculture business. And um, how is that working? Um, the platform delivers several services. It's first of all um, on the farm, on the ground uh, production and, and, and farming services and advices. It makes uh, access for a trading market. It makes it possible to do a digital payment of the um, produce, the fresh produce. And it has some minor banking and insurance services. So that is the platform. And the platform is designed for these small holders, um, only accessible for the small holders and the cooperatives they're working with. And the smartphone is given for free, and the platform is built on the blockchain. Otherwise, I wouldn't be standing here. Um, the belief of the uh, Acuity team when they started is, they, is that they concluded there is a big lack in trust. And uh, the trust uh, is the result of the trust, of the distrust among the farmers itself, the community, and the cooperative makes it that they are not really communicating in a little cooperation and coordination. Um, and there's a very strong belief that the lack of trust, the absence of trust, is the... Oh, once I'm moving here... The Sky, 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 Sky. 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 Okay. Um, the absence of trust in the whole value chain, the food value chain, is the, the dominant culprit for um, the lack of the coordination and the lack of communication within. And you can imagine that no structure, no communication um, um, within a value chain makes the value chain very inefficient. Imagine that you're a farmer and your produce is fresh, you want to harvest, but there's no transport, then after a few days the harvest is getting less and less in value. Suppose you're doing tulips and you want to harvest in week number 33 and the transport is coming in week number uh, 34, uh, well, the quality of your produce diminishes. This is of course a very clear example, but there are many examples in agriculture where the quality and the value of the value chain is very much related to the coordination and the communication within the value chain. And limited trust means limited coordination and uh, communication. Um, so the blockchain platform delivers this trust. Um, and the examples of this trust you can see in 
uh, like spoilage of produce, um, theft, um, data recording, incorruptible data recording, but as well in the area of learning for the farmer. Uh, the farmer has limit, limited access to data, so he, he is he's quite limited in learning from his own performance, uh, let alone best practices. Um, and the sharing of the equipment, is, if he's part of a cooperative, the sharing of equipment is very important. And again, if the harvest machine comes three days too late, then his harvest is less, less valued. So in a way, that's what Acuity is doing. To summarize it, um, the core focus of Acuity is on small-scale farmers, developing countries mainly. That's a huge target group. The ambition is to have to, to get in inclusiveness for all low-income farmers, smallholders. Uh, the problem is the operational lack of trust, as I explained. The solution is giving free phones. The free phones are giving actually really for free. The uh, platform, the app, is on the phone, together with some uh, apps like uh, YouTube and Facebook, uh, because the farmers really want that on it, otherwise they won't use the phone. Um, that's the modern times as well. Um, so free phones with the blockchain solution based uh, uh, in it. Um, and the result is higher income for small-scale farmers. In 2017, they did their first pilot in Kenya with wheat, and Kenya has two seasons. The first season, they did a, an analysis and, and they made inventorization of, um, of how, well, how the growing process is, and in the second one, they used the platform, and the, result, the results were astonishing, three times the normal revenue and um, so this is not, this is actually, uh, everyone who's been in, in manufacturing of production knows that if the, if the sequence in the value, in the, in the whole supply chain, has a good one and everybody communicates with each other, then the outcome is much higher. So the efficiency they gain is mostly on uh, forecasting, uh, good resource planning, um, um, well, as we say, enterprise resource planning in a, in a small nutshell. How are they doing this? Um, so this is a mobile app. They distribute to the farmers. Um, and there are about six functionalities. This is actually an older version. And, and every time they're developing and increase their functionality. But to start from the left upper part, uh, it's all about planning. So they take pictures of the harvest and upload the pictures. And uh, by this, they can uh, follow the, the growth and the cooperation they're working with and the market behind it uh, as insight as well. The tracking is all about tracking the transactions. So the transactions are being uploaded on the blockchain, not all the data, but mainly the transaction. And the farmer can see which produce are in which status at which, which part of the value chain. Um, the processing, it's helping with the processing and the harvesting of the, um, well, any agricultural commodity actually. Transfer is all about transferring of the data instead of having papers, which is quite difficult in these areas. People are illiterate or um, files may be uh, corrupted. Um, using the blockchain as a record keeping, um, it is immutable, as we know. The market, it's, it's not only giving access to a market as in selling market, but it's ex uh, as well the market of a, well, what I call a, a little Alibaba. Uh, it gives farmers access to uh, mosquito nets, solar panels, um, uh, water cleansers, etc. The basic functionalities you need as a farmer to uh, basic functionalities. Um, and last but not least, in least uh, the wallet function, in which the uh, farmer see. Okay, sorry. 
in which the pharmacy is where the produce and where the money is. So every time the transaction is being done, uh, they know exactly where the money transfer has gone to. The Acuity ecosystem, which is their business model, is as follows, and I described it already a little bit, of course. We've got the farmer who's been helped in his produce, and the produce goes to the cooperatives. <coughs> in a way, the platform helps the existence of a cooperative. It's not a digital cooperative, but it helps facilitating a cooperative. And the cooperative is doing the payment to the farmer. The Acuity platform on the uh, smart phone is being delivered to the farmer for free. And Acuity provides the technology on the platform. Several suppliers are able to deliver produce products to cooperatives, like the solar panels, I said, pesticides, bestrijdend um, 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 kunstmest, and dergelijke. Fertilizer. Fertilizer, thank you, Hans. <laughs> um, part of this uh, is commissioned, uh, goes to a unity, and partly a unity is being funded by grants, by NGOs. Now well, that's by the model they're heading for. Who's the boss? How are they organized? Um, I'm showing this because the theme is technical governance, and governance is also about organization, but it's a, an Australian-based company uh, set up in 2016. Uh, Agri Ledger, that is the platform with the charitable trust, and the farm data is owned by both Acuity and the farmer. What is the current status? As I said, the model is evolving. Every uh, month, uh, new applications are being built. Um, and they are growing uh, both in number of farmers as well as in size of the company and their, uh, in their second round of investment. They're building a uh, version 3 on the, uh, on the app at the moment. And um, they're very uh, much working with um, well, in search uh, for grants. Uh, yesterday there was a, a grant closed and uh, then search for partnerships. Especially on, in the NGOs, on the organization on the ground. So if you know companies who are, uh, well, interested in that, please let me know. And of course they're building a team. The team is about 20 with uh, some uh, um, working already from the start and a lot of volunteers who are uh, working together, making this a success. The Global Pipeline, it's where the uh, organization is at the moment. As I said, the start of the pilot was in Kenya, and uh, the other one is Bougainville, Papua and New Guinea. And, uh, now in 2018, they're expanding into Indonesia, again, Solomon Islands, Ethiopia, Guatemala, Vietnam. And the planning is to go even much further. So you can see this area is um, it's a place where the most small farmers and developing countries are located. Then the theme of 2018 uh, November. Um, it, it was in a way a bit difficult because we had already uh, 10 Am I still here? Yeah. Oh, perfect. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> oh, I'm a hero. Um, I was hearing myself. Um, so, uh, governments, technical governments is a team of, uh, of November. Uh, knowing that we did already a lot of deep dives, um, uh, we may do a kind of a small repetition of previous ones, but I saw in the audience that most of you are here for the first time, so I'm not too scared about that. Um, um, and I have to do a little step backwards uh, to explain you how we, how we did this month deep dive because this will be the, the structure for the coming years as well. Normally we would invite people from the audience to have a deep dive for the next month, but every Tuesday there's a team of blockchain enthusiasts, <coughs> it's called the Block Dumb, and they're working on a, a question. 
So we added the question of equity to the team and they worked on this uh, theme the last week. Um, so the technical governance is, is much about which blockchain do you use and uh, is a blockchain necessary or not and um, um, which one should be most suitable. Well, um, Henk was, Henk, uh, who's not here at the moment, um, he's a preacher of the uh, so-called open and public blockchain. And this is not actually the case for the equity. So, first uh, question which came up, whether it is a open or not. And there are different, different uh, assessment strategies for that. Uh, I don't want to go through them again because this is what we've done in the third deep dive. If you're interested, we have the back data. And uh, we have had Hans as well who was there on the deep dive on selecting blockchain platform. Um, so we can have a little bit more of chat on that area. Um, but I do want to address the question on the fact whether it's an uh, open or a closed permission blockchain or not. And I hope that in the meantime, I've been talking, Angus is on the line. And let me introduce you to Angus. He, you don't see him yet, but he is in Australia based. It is about 3 a.m. in the morning. He just woke up for us, which is he doing every month. So he more or less got used to it. Although every time I feel a bit ashamed that we have to wake him up uh, that early. Um, Chris, is there any white small? Uh, whether uh, Angus is. Uh, give me, give me one I'm going to give you an extra second. So, the question I, I, I showed this page to Angus, and um, I told him that uh, every time the question comes up again on the fact whether or not you are an open or a closed blockchain, permissioned or not permissioned. And, um, well, I don't know about your technical skills in the blockchain area, but if it's open, if it's accessible for everyone, um, there's no judgment up front who can join, who cannot. Uh, there are also some disadvantages, um, a lot of nodes, a lot of computer power, uh, it may have a little bit lesser speed. So there are reasons to choose for a permission. And my question for Agnes, my first question for Agnes would be, can you tell us again, please, why you, at the beginning, first question is, you've chosen for a permission blockchain, and um, do you have any plans on the longer term to open it up into a more open blockchain? I don't think you heard this question. <laughs> no, I said, you know what I said?
do we need a private, do we need a public? It's more about what can we do to demonstrate the use case. Uh, and now proving the use case, if we're going to transition into that scaling phase, what does that mean for us? So the reality is we actually are looking uh, at migrating our blockchain platform and that we would move to a blockchain platform that has a public blockchain element. Um, and, and it's kind of about staggering it to say, well, maybe we can start with a private blockchain because it's actually lower cost. And you know, as a startup, especially a tech startup working in developed countries, um, you know, you're on a limited budget. And so it's kind of like, well, can we do proof of concept? Does it actually show that we can do this? And then you're okay, well, what are the implications from a security perspective? Does the blockchain actually provide the functionality it's meant to? Um, and I think something that we're kind of been looking at is going, well, where can we host nodes on our blockchain that are within a community to kind of enhance that security aspect? So it's not all centrally located within a community. Um, so we definitely I understand kind of some of the questions around a, a private blockchain and I think our intention is to kind of move with the technology in relation to our community size. And perhaps the final kind of important thing to note about this is, you know, unlike a cryptocurrency where if I'm a, a hacker and I hack in and I steal some cryptocurrency, it's, a, you know, it's immediate value. The assets that we're managing are, are transactions are between farmers and farm cooperatives. So say if I was like, I'm going to hack this uh, platform, this blockchain, um, this private blockchain, and I'm going to move these assets into my own wallet. I would, at this point in time, I would have to physically go into that country, I would have to physically go to that company and be like, hi, I'm Angus, I'm here to collect my payment for my five bags of coffee. Um, so you can kind of see already how there's a very, very long incentive for it. The cost to do that is so incredibly high, and the incentive, the reward is actually so low that it doesn't make sense. If a cryptocurrency comes into the system, that would be done on a public blockchain without question. Okay. okay. So, so I have the that you can't work on an analytic approach that you can imagine that you uh, uh, transfer it to a public, public, public when, when uh, needed need is necessary. There's, There's an enormous echo. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I would want to ask you about the vulnerabilities, but you already said the risk of hacker. Um, can, can you elaborate a little bit more on new applications to come? Yeah, um, so I think, you know, it's, it's kind of amazing when you, when, you know, all, I'm guessing everyone in the room, I, I would ask everyone to put their hand up, but I can't see you, so I'm, I'm just going to assume that everyone is, <laughs> well, it, this is, it's not even, it's not even worth a hands up exercise, because I, I would almost guarantee that everyone in this room has a smartphone. Um, um, and for anyone who doesn't, is there someone a smartphone? without a smartphone? <laughs> no, no, no hands. Okay, there you go. Um, so we were all intimately familiar, uh, you know, in the you know, countries. I'm from Australia and the Netherlands and, and, <coughs> and abroad. Um, we're intimately familiar with how powerfully transformative a, a smartphone is. So for our community, it's incredibly exciting to know that um, building from the base of a, an immediately relevant platform, which is uh, providing secure transactions for small, low-income farmers, um, that you can obviously start to layer on of uh, additional services via the application which can directly benefit the farmer. So examples of this that we've been thinking of, and there, there's two contexts, and I'll kind of get to both, but obviously there's the immediate examples of uh, microfinance, you know, we can partner with financial institutions who can deliver their services because they can't currently deliver all of it. It's very, very ineffective. And some of the countries where people go to a bank that maybe opens one day a week, and they'll stand in line for eight hours just to get a single payment, it's incredibly inefficient, uh, and it's really hard, especially if they're dispersed uh, geographically. Um, so all of a sudden, you've, you've got this, uh, you, you've got a farmer's profile, you've done KYC, um, and a bank can actually start to issue them small, low-cost loans. And then, as you kind of build that with payment history, you get a credit score for the farmer. So the farmer's actually starting to develop a credit score. You know, if they're a good entrepreneur, if they've got a small farm and they're able to sell well, um, you know, they can probably get a better credit rating and a lower overall uh, interest rate. And again, a bank's interest rate is going to be much, much lower than the local loan sharks. You know, a lot of these communities, one of the most successful forms of income is local loan sharks who charge extremely high levels of interest. And it's a really um, aggressive and, um, what's the word, it's a very, uh, basically, it targets a vulnerable, so it's not a very healthy, it's not a very good uh, situation. So that's, that's one instance. But something else that we're really excited about with the platform is that there's the opportunity to partner with institutions that might be, it's maybe it's a university, and this university is looking at Poker Point Aura, 
and they've basically developed a disease tracking module for Cocoa Pondora. They can deploy that by the making the application to the farmers who are growing cocoa, and the farmer can actually get a whole instruction guide on this is what you should be doing practically to avoid getting Cocoa Pondora. The reason we see that as being really exciting is because like, really, we just want to be in the platform. We want to have our core services we provide to farmers. We don't want to do all of it. But there are so many institutions globally working on so many of these different challenges for smallholder farmers. And if we can partner with them and we give them our API information, they can plug in with an applet. It's a lot less development cost for them. And we strengthen the service we're providing by being able to give new information to the farmer. OK, great. Um, there's a lot of growth opportunities, um, but I, can, I think there's a challenge of scope and control, control as well. Um, the last two minutes, I'd like to give the audience as well the opportunity of asking questions. Are there any? It's very silent. It's very, very silent. This is the moment you can ask anything from a concept that's actually already deployed, so go ahead. Don't be afraid to ask me. I'm Australian. I won't buy it. No questions? Okay. Um, perhaps on the ethical part, uh, Angus, who can join, who cannot join? Uh, how do you regulate it? So I guess the way it works at the moment is that a unique kind of, uh, I, I guess that the, the top level controls who can join and who can't join. But the way we're set it up, the way we're setting it up is that uh, we do it in partnerships with local NGOs. So say in Indonesia, for example, there's a uh, cocoa cooperative we're working with, and there's a local not-for-profit called Kalamanjari that works with the farmers, and, and they're kind of our on-ground partner that kind of helps our community deliver our services. Um, with Kalamanjari, what we'd really be doing is we'd be getting the, the NGO, maybe it's World Food Program, um, maybe you know much bigger NGO, but he, regardless, it's, we partner with the NGO, and we basically vet them and then they actually control the onboarding of users who participate in the program. Um, and the reason we do that is we can vet uh, you know, an NGO partner, we can kind of do the, the due diligence on them to say, you know, this is a target area that we're trying to support, um, they can have access to the platform, but then they're the ones who are actually responsible for onboarding their users. So a unit is not individually onboarding all of these users, which would obviously cause an issue with scaling. So it means that we can kind of partner uh, at that co-op slash NGO level and then they're doing the rest of the onboarding of the farmers. That's how it currently works. It may evolve in the future, I'm not really sure, but that's kind of the best format we've seen so far. Okay. Um, so very close cooperation with NGOs. Um, it's a wide decision, I think, having someone who's really working on the ground at the field. Okay, I think we... And the last question from the audience, I'm looking at this very, very short one, yeah, well, a very super short answer. The short question is a short answer. answer. How many farmers have been connected to the social How many farmers are currently connected and what is the percentage of objective for 2019? That's a good question. Um, I mean, I think we've still got very low view today. Um, but the way we set up was we wanted to do our pilots and do our proof of concept. In Indonesia, where we are, I think we've got access access to about 3,000 farmers, but at this stage, it might be 100 farmers that we're working with because it's a pilot to begin with. Uh, that's typically the model we've seen, is that we start with a small, it might be 50 to 100 farmers for a pilot, and then pending it's obviously a stable environment and had a good outcome, you can then look to scale to a wider community. In Bougainville, um, you know, I think there's around 50,000 cocoa farmers that we're hoping to connect with. But again, we're in very early stages in Bougainville, and um, this is kind of, I guess, one of the challenges. And, and this is, again, as Jörg pointed out, the reason why the partnerships with the NGOs is so important, that when you come into these communities for the first time, it can be very hard building your relationships with the farmers, and the NGOs actually act as that bridge. But then the next step beyond that is actually understanding the local ecosystem and doing potentially some capacity building or at least understanding what capacity they have to expand. Um, and so it's not just NGOs that are going to help us scale, uh, it's companies like FutureCell uh, who operate in, in Papua New Guinea uh, and mobile telecom operators that I guess quite important in terms of uh, enabling the infrastructure that allows farmers to have reception. Uh, for 20, for 20, oh sorry, sorry, short, short. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Uh, just, just, just give the percentages of growth number, like 10%, half 
your media all the hours is great, but of course you have a lot of content today. So uh, I would like to invite you to take your seat because I'm, I'm really uh, happy to come back to to enlighten us on the main specifics of our culture and what we're waiting for everybody to feel their seat. I'm quickly going to go around the course of my microphone and ask some questions. So, the main specific smart contracts. Have you heard about this already? Have you heard already about the main specific smart contracts or is this new? New, ah, very good. And are you here today, especially for the main specific smart contracts? So basically, I don't know anything about anything except how to make a language about anything that I don't know anything about. <laughs> so, uh, what is the link with blockchain? I run uh, this year. I run one project with blockchain, which is about identity management, together with IMG and uh, Deutsche Telekom. And next year, I will be starting two blockchain projects. One actually in the domain of logistics with uh, Post, Utrecht, uh, and other projects. Okay, so. Of course, there's a little bit of marketing here. Let's call that's our key technology. Full programming language. Check it out if you like programming. Uh, I'll come back to that. Why this is relevant. Okay, so you've all heard of uh, disasters from blockchain platforms like this, right? This was a very famous hack uh, on, uh, with uh, the DAO on the Ethereum blockchain. And basically, somebody could take away 50 million dollars uh, due to a software bug smart contract code. So and if you look at what are the reasons for this work, then uh, there's this page here, and they say it has to do with a re-entrancy problem, right? So well, what is a re-entrancy problem? That's sort of that a function re-enters itself. And uh, that happens when you have a recursive call to your own function. Doesn't really matter if you don't know what it is, but anyway, uh, it's also emphasized here, you have a recursive call, uh, that uh, you know can be hijacked as it were unless it's coded very carefully. So the point here is that re-entrancy problem, recursive call functions, that's programming language speak, right? It has nothing to do with contracts in general. So basically these languages that are used, or at least the solidity of the language on uh, Ethereum, is, is a programming language, right? It has programming language concepts and, 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 and vocabulary. Um, of course, this was not the only bug. There's uh, this uh, uh, web page here that uh, 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 lists num the number of attacks and scams that were all caused by software problems in smart contract code. To highlight a couple of them, 
So uh, you know the vulnerability in some version of the wallet software, and then there is 150,000 of ether stolen. Here's another example. Uh, another bug in the software code facing more than 275 million dollars. So it's all about bugs, right? Software has bugs. Why as software has the uh, software have bugs? Because it's very hard to write software. Smart contracts are also very hard to write. Uh, but here, there's actually money at stake, right? So it's extremely dangerous to use the ordinary tools for that we use for software development for those smart contracts. Um, to give you an example, this is some Solidity code. I have no clue what it does. Really? No. I mean, it's just functions and it has some parameters. You know, it looks like program code. I can probably understand it if I study it. But the point is, this is programmer speak, right? This has nothing to do with the contracts that are actually executed on, 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 on the blockchain. And that's a real problem. Uh, and also, if you look at the language itself, uh, I always joke about Solidity that it's actually JavaScript minus objects plus stuff. There is some domain-specific contract like stuff, but basically it has functional abstraction, conditionals, you know, if and else, recursion, loops, uh, oh, that's a typo, it should be exception handling, uh, side effects, right, side effects, modifying uh, uh, the store, uh, the, your database, very bad to reason about code. Put this all together and you get the ordinary mess that is sort of uh, your average website if you look at the source code of that, but with money at stake. Um, this is a well-recognized problem. Uh, actually, last week I was in Boston at Uppsala, a very uh, top-tier conference on programming language technology, and there was this paper called Man Max, Surviving Out of Gas Conditions in Ethereum Smart Contracts. Totally badass paper, won the best paper award. It shows that this is extremely hard. I mean, if you read this paper, this is the hardcore programming language uh, research that you can get. Not a good thing, right? Because if it takes these guys to find such bugs as far as contract codes, you're in a bad spot. Um, there's also this uh, rather amusing uh, uh, presentation by Fritz Henglein from a couple of time, uh, uh, a couple of years ago already. Smart contracts are neither smart nor contracts. And uh, basically what he concludes is that smart contracts are self-executing contracts, programs, in complex Turing complete programming languages. Turing complete means that you can compute any computable function, which means basically you cannot analyze or practice automatically. Right? So you have to think really hard. It mixes all kinds of stuff, rules and actions, right? Obligations and, and, and duties and so on are mixed with you know transferring money from one place to another. And you get hard to analyze low-level programs. Not smart, right? You need people like this to analyze it, and you want ordinary programmers to be able to reason about smart contracts. Okay, uh, so let's have a look at programming in general. So anyone knows what this is? The intoxilizer? I'm sorry. No? No. Does I know the other know? one. <laughs> Does anyone know what a breathalyzer is? Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah, alcohol. Yes. So it's a machine that measures alcohol in your blood after, you know, but it's used by the police after you've been driving. And this is an interesting case because in the US, uh, a guy was tested and they said, yes, you have too much alcohol in your blood, in your blood. Um, you get a fine. And then he said, no, you're wrong. I'm going to fight this. So it went to court and uh, eventually the judge ordered uh, the source code of that machine to be released. So what did they get? 80,000 lines of this kind of crap. Right? So, trying to figure out what went wrong in code like this, knowing the domain is about alcohol measurement. Turned out there was a bug there, the average was not computed correctly, and he was sort of, uh, how do you say, uh, spoken. Released. Released. <laughs> so, but <laughs> you can imagine how error prone and uh, uh, time consuming this is to analyze this. And, and this is also in normal programming. You know, if you look at the code, or your fellow programmer after one year has to look at the code, he looks at this stuff, and he needs to reconstruct that stuff, right? Not good. Um, so 
let's make something more high level, right? So what is high level? It's the language that you use to develop your software, programming language or not, uses the concepts and terminology of your own, of the domain, right? The problem domain, not the computer, the hardware, the bits, the bytes, the ifs, the numbers, the memory, etc. Right? Because then you get programs that are closer to the problem domain, easier to understand by people who know about the problem domain, and it's easier to reason about their correctness. This is of course what the UI need. We have lots of domain specific languages in uh, various uh, fields. You know, electronic circuits, some chemical stuff, mathematics, more chemical stuff, right? And the key of these languages are that they are less expressive, right? You cannot express everything using this graphical language, only electronic circuits, right? So, and they are optimized for experts in electronics. This is optimized for experts in chemistry. So they make people using those languages more efficient. Shorter programs, better understanding, less degrees of freedom, less degrees of freedom to make mistakes. Uh, here are a couple of more. This is also very interesting. Anybody knows what this would be? <laughs> Sorry? Trains. Uh, well, close. Uh, close? Yeah, nobody knows this, uh, but <laughs> it's a fun example anyway. Sorry? One more? No, no. Did? No. It looks like, it looks like um, uh, models for, for uh, like, like basic machinery, just map. No, 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 completely wrong. <laughs> so this is a language to describe formation, airplanes doing formation <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Right? So, and this one is actually a language for doing ballets also. You know, even in ballet they use the rest of the languages. So, okay, uh, but back to computers. Uh, it's also not an old idea because even in computer land, uh, APT was basically the first uh, domain specific languages developed already in 1957. Right? 1957. This is before the 60s. Uh, so, and then this is a language to control robotic arms. Right? So, it's maybe hard to see why this is about robotic arms, but at least you cannot write a business application in this language. You can only control robotic arms, right? So, domain-specific language. Okay, but now uh, we have had an intuition about what is a domain-specific language. How do we model or create these things, right? How, do, how can we make these things? Well, first of all, if you look at a domain, in this case, I um, have the domain of trees, you see that it's extremely rich, right? The fine detail, and, and this is the real world, right? The real world is complex and messy and chaotic. And um, if you want to model every other detail of this domain, then we basically would be doing uh, natural science or philosophy. We don't want to do that, right? We don't want to do software. So the first step is, oh, oh wait, I've got too fast. So what happens now is that you know, this, there's this domain knowledge in people's head, and there's some hard labor, and then you get all this gibberish here that is the low level code. Right? That's sort of the normal programming uh, process. And if you don't want to change or verify anything about this low level code, you have to look at these chips. Right? Reconstruct that image, which actually contains the domain knowledge. Not good. So, what we're going to do, we're going to stylize the domain, identify the essential parts of this domain. In this case, I would say, okay, it has leaves, it has leaves, and it has a stem, I don't know. Uh, so this is an extremely simplification of reality, of course, but for some purpose, it might be exactly the essential parts that we care about. And then, we can write what we want directly in this high-level language, and use automation to create this gibberish. Right? So then instead of hard labor, there is a machine here now, also known as a compiler or a code generator, uh, which encodes how stuff should be executed uh, from these high level languages. And now, if you want to change or verify, etc., we have to look at this. Right? So three experts can just inspect those three models, diagrams, or pictures, uh, or smart contracts that are high level, 
uh, in order to reason about it, in order to change it and modify it, and etc. So, of course, now the, the burden has shifted, right? This is all good, we don't have to care about this anymore, but somebody needs to build this machine. So now we can go one meta level up, which uh, is sort of approaching my uh, And that's what we do at CW. What we do at CWO SWAT. So the special weapons and tactics team at uh, CWI uh, builds tools for understanding existing software better, reverse engineering, but also tools to design languages to improve software construction before we are in a messy situation. Right? So we don't want to analyze gazillions of lines of solidity code. No, we want to make sure that we will not have a gazillion lines of solidity code uh, to analyze. Right? So this, here comes our key technology uh, around the corner, which is RASCAL, a meter programming language, a language workbench. It's a domain-specific language to build domain-specific languages, right? Meta. So uh, if you want to build a domain-specific language, you should check it out, because it, we're really good at this. <laughs> Sounds a little bit arrogant, but we've done it so many times now, we know that we are on the right path. So basically, RASCAL is this factory to build all the notations and, and, and uh, automation uh, uh, machines that you might need. Of course, this is not for free, but at least it helps in sort of iterating your language uh, in that fast way. How have we applied this? Well, we did this in many domains. So we have uh, a PC student of mine did a DSL for digital forensics, which is actually in use now at the Forensic Institute. It allows people who are experts in file formats to directly describe the structure of certain files that they are looking for on hard drives confiscated from uh, suspected criminals. Right? So file experts can do this instead of hardcore so software engineers or programmers. We did a language for questionnaires, which we used to model form-like applications, like the text filing application. If you ever have looked under the cover of how the Dutch tax authority builds their software, it's both a crying shame and super impressive. Because they, they actually manage to do all this stuff by hand, whereas basically your tax filing application is a spreadsheet on steroids. Right? There's not much going on there except entering data and doing computations on it. So uh, we tried to do that. I actually almost managed to file my own taxes using my own tax application because this is a free market. Uh, but I wasn't quite there yet. So we did for router software, for image processing, for relational modeling. Interestingly enough, we have a graphical DSL for micro machinations where we model the, the gaming con economies of, of computer games, right? Sort of the logic of how you lose coins, you gain health, and uh, etc. Uh, so we are very happy with this sort of stuff that we did, that we actually started a startup that now does this, exactly this, for commercial parties. So they are building languages for customers. I don't know about you, but I find this really cool, because it's about building languages for customers. Let that sink in. Uh, but anyway, Back to blockchain, if you look at the history of smart contracts, you have Nick Sabo, right? The source of it all, or most of it. Already in 2002, he wrote this sort of sketchy paper, which you can find here, a formal language for analyzing contracts, and he never did a DSL or an implementation, and he has a sort of final section where he says, okay, let's translate this in computer science kind of terms but it never sort of materialized into an actual working tool. But the interesting bit is that if you look at this language, it's not a programming language. You cannot compute the Fibonacci numbers with this language. You can only write contracts down, right? So Nick Sarko did a very good domain analysis or ended up being an expert of financial contracts that allowed him to design a language, however sketchy it may have been, that exactly, or exactly, at least better captured the notion of a contract than some JavaScript uh, minus something plus something, right? And also, if you look at here, then, then most of the terms you see are directly related to, con to contracts, right? There are no 
uh, ifs or ints or assignments or array bounds or, or functions and recursion. It's all not there. It's much closer to the world of people who normally would think in uh, domestic uh, in uh, terms of confidence. Okay, of course, there are many more domains, right? Uh, as I said earlier, I don't know anything about any of these domains, but I can make languages out of them nonetheless. And uh, so, financial contracts is well done, well known. I mean, there are sort of other earlier work on that. Uh, supply chain, logistics, that's my project next year with Post Italiane and uh, another, and other partners. For identity management, we have a DSL that describes the structure of claims definitions, right? If I give a, uh, a test that you are over 18, then I can show this claim to my liquor store when I buy whiskey without showing uh, my age or social security number. Yeah, so food, right? Something with food. I have to discuss about what would be possible there. But of course, this list is unedited, right? I mean, uh, you can find uh, many domains where this is relevant. <coughs> okay, so what I am already summarizing. So, if you write stuff like this, you get stuff like that, right? Low level code especially Turing complete loaded in Turing complete languages that have full expressivity cannot be analyzed automatically. It requires hard labor and a lot of sweat to make these contracts correct. So my hypothesis is if you use languages like Solidity, this will always work around the corner. So I'm proposing to not use these general purpose things, right? You don't want these heavyweight tools where you can do everything if you only want to do one thing, right? So, you know, this is a very versatile tool, right? You can do everything with this Swiss Army knife, but it doesn't excel at anything, right? These things, they are ex much smaller, they have a limited ex expressivity. The sushi knife excels as cu at cutting fish, right? Maybe you can also kill somebody with it, but you sure, uh, sure as hell cannot screw a screw with it. I mean, you would not want to do that. So, and finally, so how do we go from these little languages to actual implementations? And I've highlighted a little bit of our work at CWI at uh, University of Groningen, where we built RESCO, which is like up here to build this, right? So it's the meta DSL. You can use that language to define your own language notations and compilers and implementations and many, many tools. But okay. Isn't, okay. isn't the language on the left side not the basic for all the other languages? I mean, at the end, it all comes back to bits and bytes. So sure. go through the electronic wire. So the question is whether these highly low-level languages are not below the, low, the higher-level languages, right? So yes, of course. So this machine will turn a high-level language into lower-level language. But if you do this correctly, then the end user programmer will not be able to express everything because he is writing his code in, at this level. Right? So there will be fewer degrees of freedom, which means fewer degrees of freedom to make mistakes. It's really about reducing expressivity and thereby getting a more confident a more confidence in that the code that is generated will execute correctly which means less choice. I mean, the whole economy is based on granular yes. equations, and, and, and if we miss that, then... Yes, so, but of choice. course, but, I mean, there's always a trade, right? If you want more flexibility, yeah, then you have to go back here, maybe. Or, and that's how we sort of look at this, you have to make this so good that if you need a change, you can actually change your language if it needs to be done, right? In an easy way. And you know, with a tool like this, the, the, the digital forensics DSL that we developed consists of 1,200 lines of code. 1,200 lines of code, including the runtime system, it beats all existing uh, tools that they use in uh, the digital forensics world. So 1,200 lines of code is so little that you can basically do it again in one week. Right? So. Uh, that's, that's how we look at it, to mitigate that problem. Yes? You are quite certain about several DSLs that you developed in your 
were a little bit smiley about food. Uh, uh, Does it mean you don't have experience, or do you expect experience in that respect? So uh, the question is whether I have experience in food, and if I expect uh, experience to have experience in food. I don't know anything about food integrity. Right. I'm completely new to this domain. I'm happy to learn about it to see if there is, uh, you know, cross fertilization uh, to stay in the agricultural terminology. But um, uh, as I said, I don't know much about the specific domains uh, except the ones that we've already done for the substitute. Very interesting. Okay. Let's keep further questions till you're finished because time is always our enemy here. Okay. Oh, thank you very much. No, 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 no. Okay, then, then I got then I want questions. Yes, you do questions. Oh. First of all, I'm going to thank, thank Thais. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'm going to ask Chris if he can maybe switch computers around and then you can maybe ask a question. Um, and I'm going to ask the obvious question maybe because you were uh, talking about hacks and how. Um, uh, traditional, let's name it, uh, name it traditional programming language made it, made it possible. Uh, is it, uh, are there domain specific smart languages that can totally exclude hacking? No. <laughs> yes, that was the answer I was expecting. Um, and then another very obvious question before I let any of you um, have a go. Um, Spaghetti code is, of course, also a, a well-known problem in traditional code. And for those of you who don't know, that's um, like a cluster of code, and that you uh, just use many, uh, many lines of code to say something very small, and it makes all uh, very complicated. Is this something that's possible with domain-specific smart languages? Is there spaghetti domain-specific smart language codes? Uh, very good question. Um... This, of course, depends on the DSL itself, right? If you think about spaghetti code, this is actually a very good point, but e because even without the question of correctness being in play, you can also have very bad sp uh, spaghetti code in smart contract languages, which just makes them hard to uh, understand, which makes them hard to validate in terms of what you actually promise to people, right? So, spaghetti code is related to if statements, loops, long methods, long functions. If you make a DSL, basically doesn't have such features, then, then there is less risk of people messing up and writing large amounts of uh, uh, spaghetti code. The fact that the domain specific language has a higher level of abstraction means that normally programs will be much smaller in general. So you avoid that problem almost automatically. But of course, if you make a bad DSL, then it can happen again. Well, of course, I'm not the only one with questions. Do keep in mind that we will be moving to the panel soon, so you can have to just to ask your question to more people. So, choices, choices. I'm going to try to reach you up there. Okay, Thais, thank you very much. Uh, can you think of a, uh, of a formal verification being possible to actually make a domain-specific language, for instance, to be... Uh, that you can check it to be bug free or something. Here we go. Very good question. Um, again, of course, this depends on the DSL, but if you limit the expressivity enough, then yes, this is possible sometimes. Uh, of course, there are limits to the, the extent of the correctness proof, because it will always be in a sort of decentralized and open world. But uh, a case in point, this is actually not on the slide there. We have a PhD student now that is doing a DSL for, uh, for a bank, IMG Bank, which is of limited expressivity and it allows us, up to a certain extent, prove that certain situations cannot happen. Right? So we let the machine search for, for instance, uh, and, and a funny example was uh, a savings account should never have below zero balance. Right? So you ask the system, can it ever happen that my savings account goes below zero? Surprise, it could happen. Because if you have hyperinflation and you have negative interest rates or whatever, then actually you have to pay when you have to get interest and then bam, it goes below zero. Right? Oops, I didn't have thought of it. So 
these things definitely help, but you need to reduce expressivity, otherwise it won't scale. Let's indeed take one more question before we move to the panel. Yeah, thanks guys for this nice uh, presentation, very interesting. I was wondering, is there already uh, a platform that you can deploy smart contracts on with the DSLs made by Resco? Uh, yeah, because it's we need to speak. Um, so, smart contracts maybe no, uh, because we haven't developed smart contract languages yet. But this language we used in the identity management application with IMG, which is a schema language, sort of you know, a structure definition language of claims, uh, is developed using RESPL and is compiled to the low-level claim schemas of Hyperledger really, which is sort of stored there and is used actually to, to sort of you know create claims by the testers and so on. And also there, you know, if you look at the Hyperledger uh, claim schema language is basically JSON. It's super low level. I mean, your eye, your eyes start to bleed when you look at it. And and, but, and so now we have this higher level language where you can check that you you know you use the fields correctly and there is sort of no inconsistency. And then in the end we transform it to this low level business so that it just runs on their platform. So we don't have to modify their platform either. I just realized that I lost one of my panelists, so wait for a moment till he comes back. Do, is there any questions still? And I'm quickly going to invite the rest of the panel, that would be Yoko, to join me up front. Wait for the other one to arrive. Chris. <coughs> ah, panelists. Yes, please. Ah. Ah. It's your yeah. Okay. Uh, you know that it's a writer. Yeah, yeah. You are. Uh, from, I don't know, you said you didn't understand, so I was like, okay. Um, uh, so, uh, ha, ha, I'm, 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 I'm very intrigued by your, your, your the proposal, but I'm very in, into, you know, how, how does it actually, how does it work under the hood? So, how are you able to take from any, any language and then compile it to a high level language? Sorry. So first of all, I think we, we will never go from a low level language to a high level language because that means that you have to infer domain constructs. And that's actually not possible because the lower level language is more expressive. So you can express things that are impossible to express in a higher level language. So we're not doing it. So basically, this is all about forward engineering. Right? Huh? Forward engineering. Okay. So, so you build a new contract using the new higher level language. And as a result of using that high level language, you get certain guarantees that you wouldn't get at the, if you implemented it at the lower level. Right? And these guarantees can mean in terms of performance, in terms of correctness, in terms of productivity, in terms of uh, error messages. There's all kinds of benefits that uh, might be uh, available when you do this. Do, do you build this translation for the customer, or could, say, for example, me? Uh having knowledge about smart contracts, uh, use your program right now to, to do this transition array. So uh, we do this for the customer, because so that if you build a language, you, have, you don't only need, you not only need domain knowledge, but you also need language engineering knowledge. So but we, say I learn your language. Yeah, then say, then, thank you. Maybe this is thank more you. for the drinks afterwards, because now you can hear. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. I'm very excited. You should follow my course in college. Yeah. Thank you for the answer. Okay, awesome. Thank you for your answer. Okay, and during this uh, question and answer, we are joined by our panelists today, uh, Joko Speck and Krijt Superman, and I'm going to give you the mic to introduce yourself, actually. Joko. All right, thank you. Uh, so, my name is Joko Speck. I'm a researcher at uh, TNO, it's a Dutch Research Institute. Um, my main focus at TNO you know, is uh, connect, connected business. So, uh, how, how do uh, IT systems work? How can IT systems work together in an effective way? And the uh, last two years we've been focusing on, on blockchain a lot, but we also focus on, uh, on semantics and uh, other things. And uh, these last, and our, a lot of our use cases are focused in the, in the agri food uh, domain, so uh, that's been our goal. Well, my name is Kjern uh, Sutterman and I'm a science and tech journalist and I just wrote a book on cryptocurrencies. 
Um, also talks a little bit about solidity and some smart contracts. Um, so in some way, I'm the higher level of, well, I, don't, I cannot program myself. Um, I can only copy paste very well. Um, actually, I believe that Vitalik Buterin really recently said um, that he should have called it persistent scripts instead of smart contracts because of that would have been less popular. Um, but that's, uh, I think that's about it. Um, you go. Well, then my first question is for you actually, because you've done, of course, a lot of research into blockchain and cryptocurrencies for writing your book. Uh, did you come across the very specific smart contract languages and in what form? Well, uh, the main, uh, the, the, um, the cryptocurrency right, cryptocurrencies are researched for Ethereum and Bitcoin. Those were the, the, the main drivers in the book and all the other uh, cryptocurrencies, they try to do more or less the same. So I did not look at other cryptocurrencies. I know that NEO uses, uh, you can use five or seven uh, different programming languages. Um, but what I found with Solidity, it's very easy to program, but it's very difficult not to make any mistakes. And the, the big problem with, um, uh, with blockchains is, you, whatever you put on the blockchain, that smart contract will run forever. Um, I mean, it will not run forever, but it will stay there forever. So whenever you use your smart contract, you, you put it on the blockchain and someone can use it. And when there's a fault in the smart contract, you have not uh, killed the smart contract, which, which I believe you can do if you put it in your contract code, um, then someone can always make mistakes with it. So that's a big problem. Like there is, it looks like a nice contract and this is for renting out a house. Um, and you are starting to use it, but there's a certain per parameter which is wrong, and you use that parameter by accident, and then you lose all your money or something like that. So that's it's really important to have good languages, and I've seen more uh, similar projects here and there. Yeah, well, in September yeah. we had your uh, colleague uh, Peter joining us for a case, and he was enlightening us on using uh, blockchain for weed. So Dano, of course, does some domain-specific blockchain research. Did you uh, or your colleagues of Dano also look into domain-specific uh, smart contract languages? Uh, no, we did not, to be sure. Uh, to be sure. But um, I do think they are an interesting concept. We, uh, I'm not sure if you're aware with Ampersand. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's one of the toys of my uh, uh, colleagues from Groningen. Uh, so I think you know, that could be, uh, I think they could be very useful in, in, in the blockchain world. Um, but uh, I'm a bit skeptical about using smart contracts at all. Uh, because I think they're most often they're used in, a, in, a, in an incorrect way. Um, you model the world in a certain way. Uh, for example, if you, if you model the, uh, a certain a, a typical domain, like uh, a, 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 the graves, uh, for example, like, uh, you, you model the supply chain of grapes, you model the way the, the business works, uh, you put that way, that model on the, on the, in, in the form of a smart contract on the blockchain, uh, and you will start interacting with this blockchain, but then the rules, of, of, uh, the rules change. Uh, the way of working, the way of doing business changes, uh, so your smart contract is invalid. But it's immutable, so you have to plan in advance uh, to update your smart contract functions with a new smart contract. So it's, it, it makes it a lot, a lot more complex. So, can I, yeah. Can I respond on that? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah. I'm not sure. Do we need a microphone? No, no, you can There we have. We have. Uh, we think we have a, a type of solution for this, but maybe we. Yes. Well, um, <laughs> I, I recognize your problem, yeah. but uh, what I see right now in the blockchain space with a few companies who use blockchain in a way which is usable, uh, like the ticketing company Guts with the Get Protocol, mm -hmm. they use different smart contracts for everything <laughs> they do. Which is of course a bit complicated right now, but um, as a customer, uh, your your uh, um, demands will be put in your own smart contract. Uh, in some way, I'm not exactly sure how they do that, but um, for what I can see right now, that's the only usable way because if you can only code so many things in one smart contract to keep it useful. And what's your solution? Uh, what we propose is uh, it, it it could uh, it, it takes away. A lot of the responsibility from a smart contract to the edge of the, of the, of the, of the blockchain. So what you do is you put on the 
on the ledger uh, your data you want to publish about. For example, I'm, I've brought uh, an X amount of graves uh, and, I, and, and they're organically certified. This is what I put on the blockchain. And then we use a, a semantic model to describe this data. And with this publication, we also publish uh, the business rules that they have to comply with. For example, uh, an organic certificate has to have an expiry date, or it has to have a, a specific address at which notifications for this certificate are to be published. Uh, and then if you put that, if you put those together on the blockchain, then anyone on the edges of the blockchain, any user, uh, they can look at the data and they can look at the rules and they can check whether or not the data conforms to the rules. Uh, which makes it possible to use the latest version of your domain model with every new publication. Uh, and it also, uh, you don't need any uh, every node in the network to actually perform logic uh, in a way that smart contracts require the, uh, the nodes to do. And we're currently experimenting with that. Yeah, I wanted to hear from Tess because uh, Joko was talking about uh, uh, immutability in a changing world. Uh, how do domain specific smart contract uh, trick languages take that into account? Well, I guess they don't because everything you put in the blockchain is immutable, right? So, uh, but it's a, I mean, this is one of the good things about blockchains, but also the bad thing, right? So, you cannot fix bugs in smart contract code. Was just said, it just keeps on running unless you anticipate it and you kill yourself or something. Um, but the other thing is that um, anything that you, uh, you know, uh, there's also a sort of big elephant in the room about GDPR, right? As soon as you put something on a blockchain that's GDPR sensitive, then you're basically screwed, I think. But do we put stuff on the blockchain or only hashes? I don't know, it depends who you ask, I guess. But I mean, <laughs> everybody's talking about blockchain all these days, and sometimes I, I think, you know, just use a database. But um, anyway, and there's another thing I think uh, that's also related, and according to you, you say you keep all the data consistency logic outside of the chain. But still, I suspect that the data might be out of date uh, or non conforming anymore because of the stuff that you do outside of blockchain evolves to newer versions and supporting newer regulations. And this is a very real problem also, for instance, in identity management, where you want to actually, as a you know, sovereign identity owner, you want to be able to revoke certain uh, uh, claims that have been assigned to you. And uh, well, you cannot do that in a simple way, because it's, it's all there, right? It's all there. So you need to do a lot of trickery to circumvent that. Yes, and I want to ask you a very obvious question before I take some questions from the audience, namely food. We're talking about domain-specific smart languages, but we are here at the Food Integrity Blockchain Meetup. So how can we uh, increase food integrity with domain-specific smart languages? And I would like to hear from all of you, actually. Okay, well, like I said, I don't know much about the food integrity case, but uh, so I think it is similar to uh, the stuff we're going to do uh, work on next year in, in sort of the logistics area. The key thing is there that their smart contracts will be used to sort of uh, encode policies and regulations according to you know customs and, and, and transport and, and you know uh, weights and whatever, and these things need to be configured, right? So now you can know about this domain and then tell everything to a solidity program to type it in, but that's actually sort of a cause, of misunderstanding, a cause for potential misunderstanding and bugs in the smart contract codes. What we want to do is that the logistics people themselves will configure these you know, rules or contracts that guide all logistical processes. And I guess this could also be relevant for the food integrity case. Uh, in a very similar way, although with different parameters, with different concepts and different vocabulary. Yeah, I think uh, I agree with what you say. Uh, I'm not an expert in domain specific languages, languages uh, or uh, agri food specific, but uh, I could foresee that a domain specific language could be very useful to, for example, describe the domain of certifying food. Uh, in a way that uh, yeah, you can uh, make smart contracts more readable and more uh, develop them, more easy, easy, more bug-free or 
easy ways to develop by domain experts instead of a programmer uh, who first needs to become a domain expert before he can adequately uh, design a small contract. Yeah, I think I just said I'm not really an expert on uh, domain specific languages. Um, but uh, the thing I think we need to ask ourselves is what do we use blockchains for? And I think they're very good in transferring value. And I think we should maybe, maybe first look at what they can do in value chains, uh, also like in food chains, um, uh, things go from A to B to C. Where there's just a very simple logistic, like when you go, when you have one supplier and you buy from that one supplier, you don't need a blockchain. But when you have um, 20 or 40 suppliers and other chain specific stuff within, then the blockchain might become useful because of, um, because the transfer of value becomes more secure. And I think that may be a much more viable use case right now. And I think also the food, um, your blockchain is also trying to do that mainly with value, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm not, I think it starts there. Thank you. I promise some questions from the audience. Hands, please. Anyone? Come on. There's no stupid questions, and I, if there are, I have asked them already. So, anyone? Anyone at all? I can just point. Ah, yeah, I see something moving. Yes, you're here. Uh, <laughs> I waited for the other. If if I hear you well, thanks. I see a world where, where there's a lot of simplicity instead of uh, chaos uh, in, in treating data, in, in exchanging data, etc. Um, blockchain is mentioned, and what I hear most nowadays is uh, a combination of not only using blockchain technology which describes how data is secured, but also artificial intelligence which is ruling uh, in, and I, I taste uh, security in what you describe and I have other feelings when I read about uh, uh, artificial intelligence in combination with technologies like blockchain. What is your opinion about that? <laughs> well, uh, thank you for this question. Uh, so, there recently was a talk at CWI about the reliability of machine learning. This was about image recognition. And one of the demos she gave was change one pixel in the image and the, the, the machine learning completely interprets the image as a different thing. I rest your case. <laughs> so I think, so I, I don't know anything about the technicalities of machine learning, but I, I've seen amazing things uh, being done with the machine learning. So I saw one talk, other talk about a walking robot, which basically could walk through a busy city like Amsterdam from the university campus to the city center without falling over, you know, kids playing around, no traffic accident, nothing, all based on machine learning. Nobody knows why it works, but it works very good. Of course, whenever there is some kind of accountability question, all bets are off. So that's, I think, that's the next uh, horizon. I think it's called explainable AI, where you actually can have a sort of trace of argument why the AI did some things, such and so, okay. so that there is some kind of accountability. Yeah. Because otherwise it's just, you know, maybe you know this XKCD with, uh, about machine learning, where they just, you know, shuffle data in some machine, and then the wrong answer comes out, and then they shuffle more data into the machine. <laughs> It doesn't make any, it doesn't provide any insight. I'm actually quite happy that you mentioned AI because, of course, in blockchain and blockchain for food, um, we have a saying garbage in is garbage out, and we talk about blockchain on itself not being super interesting. But blockchain, of course, has to work together with other things, and with, for example, the existing technology of a company, but also with, for example, sensor data or AI. How do you see this for domain-specific uh, uh, domain smart contract languages? This should be way shorter. This is not a, <laughs> no, it's a mouthful to pronounce, but uh, what do you think is most promising combination here? Uh, well, I, I think 
actually this is I mean, these things are independent of each other, right? So I mean, there's domain-specific languages have uh, application in many areas, and if you say, okay, I'm going to do this for some kind of context on the blockchain, that's fine. Uh, if you have to do with uh, Internet of Things kind of sensor stuff, where lots of uh, uh, wiring is going on between different components and data sources and, and etc. Domain-specific languages can and have been applied in that domain too. Um, but I mean, like I said, right, it's a sort of generic concept. Uh, and depending on the situation, if there is additional value to get better guarantees, better performance, better understanding, smaller programs, etc., etc., then you could think of it. It's not for free, right? Domain analysis is hard. You have to build the language. You have to educate people who are using the language. But it can work. That's what we have seen. Uh, talking about educating people, I know we have a couple of students here in the room, and of course, lots of blockchain enthusiasts working on, for example, learning to program. How much time would it take the average student or blockchain enthusiast before they can uh, program their first? Well, here we go again. Domain specific smart contract language blockchain solution. <laughs> So I have no idea, but uh, so this Thursday I'll start my course in software language engineering at the University of Groningen, which is a third, third year bachelor program uh, pro, uh, course for computer science students. Uh, let's see how far they go in, uh, how far they are in ten months. Of course, this is without blockchain expertise, but at least I will, I hope that they will be able to build the language by themselves. So, uh, in these domain specific languages, uh, how <laughs> big is the risk that of, of scope creep? I mean, you, for example, if you want to uh, create a domain specific language for agri-food. Explain scope creep. Oh, uh, to <coughs> if you, you, you want to, uh, for example, you want to, a customer comes to you with a, with a question, uh, you think you've defined your, the question and your solution, and but the client wants more and more and more. That's yeah, just adding so more, features more, more features more and more and more features. So that everybody's on the same page. So how do you re, uh, restrict your dom <coughs> the domain? Do you have a, uh, do you start at uh, completely bundling off your domain, or how does it work? So I think the, the question has to do with how well you know your domain. Yeah. Right? So uh, there's a very old paper where they, they sort of posit this rule of thumb, uh, that is the rule of three. You basically have to have built three similar kinds of systems, you know, for the same, you know, uh, I don't know a website for three customers uh, before you know what the domain's domain actually is. Um, nonetheless, the scope creep risk is always there because people always want more and more, and I think there it's just, you know, if you're really confident that you've captured the domain, then it's a matter of saying no, yeah. because before you know it, you will have created a monster. Yeah. And there's also a famous quote by uh, Eric Mayer, you might know him, he's this crazy head, uh, head in the box from you know, formerly at Microsoft. And he has this post somewhere where he said, you know, uh, these elves, they start as tiny, cute puppies, but before you know, they are filled with devices. <laughs> and, uh, well, you know, a case in point is SQL, you know, which started as this beautiful yeah. math mathematical model of databases, and now it's, it's 10,000 page standard, it's, it's like, blah. Yeah. Oh, ah, Bernie. I have <coughs> room for, I think, two more burning questions from the audience. Hans. Yeah, this one's quite burning. Uh, hmm. Suppose I, I have a specific domain, uh, maybe food, something else, and I like to uh, develop a uh, domain specific language. In what time frame can I do that? Because you talked about your students, you hope that in 10 months, they might be able to create a language. If you have a trained professional, how long does it take? Okay. Thank you for another uh, great question. Lots of good questions today. Uh, so what I said about my students was that in 10 weeks they learn the techniques of their real language. I don't expect that they will be able to design a language. Because language design is something completely different from language engineering language. You know, building the compiler and the type checker and all those things. So, uh, language design is hard, but, uh, like all design, it's a wicked problem and it requires experience. Um, so, it really depends on how well 
on how often you did this, and, and also, of course, how complex the domain is. Right? If, if your domain actually requires like programmatic programming language features, then, well, then you also have to have knowledge of programming language features, right? Uh, if it's really sort of more like a configuration language, where right, you sort of enter some parameters and there's maybe some conditional logic, then of course the language design is much uh, limited in scope. So there's, again, fewer room to, to mess it up. Um, but, uh, yeah, if you want to build a language, you should call SWAT engineering. <laughs> Make it for you. Like calling girls busters. Yes. <laughs> Is there a final short burning question? Short. It's about the cost. Uh, this was about the time, yeah. and you twice mentioned that, of course, there are costs involved. Is this only for the corporates, or is it also for smaller, or modest companies? And do you have student licenses? <laughs> you can ask <laughs> us, Mr. Green. Green. These are two questions. So. Uh, Again, this depends on the result. I, I'm actually myself not part of SWOT engineering, so I don't know how the you know, pricing works. Uh, your question, our tool is completely open source. Uh, and you can, it's free to download and use for whatever you want to do, also commercial projects. Uh, the key thing that SWOT, SWOT engineering tries to build on is that it's never good to buy a design, you always have to develop it yourself. So the biggest risk is that you lose ownership of your design. You know, if you, maybe if you're old enough, you remember 40 else, you know, languages with screens and menus and, and, and tables and stuff. All great, you know, rapid development, and then the company that sold it goes broke or gets fused into uh, another company and then another company and another company, and then you have a code base that nobody knows in anymore. There's no support for it. Uh, so that's why if you go the DSL way, build it yourself. I think that's a lovely note to end on, and I would like to have a big applause for our whole panel. Thank you very much. And of course, normally the panel is the end of the meeting, but I'd actually like to invite the panel to take a seat, and I'd like to invite my next speaker, because we have a bonus case. That was why I was rushing you all a bit. Yeah, I can talk very fast if needed. Uh, so I would like to invite Gabriel van der Luitengaarde from, from Philips on stage because they're going to talk about how Philips has, uh, has seen 900 ledgers with the use of blockchain technology, so an actual blockchain use case. Thank you. Gabriel. Realize I'm probably the last thing between yourself and drinks and my dinner, so I'll try to uh, to uh, speed it up a little bit. Um, I'm going to talk to you about a very specific item, which is foreign currency issues in intercompany supply chain. Now that may sound very complicated. Uh, I'll try to explain it. Now, if you have questions, just ask them. They're not. They can't be stupid, um, and I'll try to do it in a way that is accessible to non-financials. So bear in mind, I, I have a financial background, so if I'm talking about something you don't understand, just, just ask. Just a brief introduction of which you need to understand about multinational companies, and Philips is just one of them, which is about how we're organized and how we operate. Now, Philips is a very traditional company, like all other multinational companies. We are addicted to SAP, so we have a lot of SAP. And we operate in over 100 countries. And <coughs> in order to do that, we have organized ourselves in uh, ORUs, as they're called, Operational Reporting Units. We have over 800, close to 900. These are all, just imagine that these are all entities that have their own ledgers. So everybody is having their own set of accounts. And nowadays, after a lot of investment, <coughs> that is, those, those 800 plus ledgers are, are operating on five SAP cards. It used to be 55, now it's five. Uh, we think that's a great achievement. Um, the interesting thing is that 
all of these entities distrust the others. <laughs> they all do their own thing. So just now we're going to talk about intercompany supply chain, which is in theory very simple. We just want to move a product from the factory to the place where we're going to sell the product. That's the only purpose of an intercompany supply chain. But this is, and I'll show you a simplified example of how that works. It's all based on that every entity involved does not trust the other entities. So it's like they treat each other as external suppliers. With purchase orders, invoices, payment terms, everything around it. Where, as I said, Phillips is no different from other multinational companies. This is very typical of other multinational companies. And um, this is across almost more than 100, company, uh, 100 countries. We trade in over 45 different currencies. And what we are going to do is use blockchain technology to build an intercompany supply chain process that eliminates all the issues that come with trading in so many different currencies. These are slides that we've created to sell the story to our CFO. So it's a bit uh, corporate, I'm afraid, but it's, uh, that's the way it is. And I think you need to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm on the Carry on. Uh, no idea. Okay. Oh, there we go. So, um, the problem that we have is that internal transactions <coughs> need to cover multiple foreign currencies. So the, the example we always use is that we, we move the shavers from the factory in Drachten in the Netherlands to the distribution center in the US where we start to sell them. For customers, it's not relevant. It's just moving a a pile of boxes from one place to the other. But, yeah, this is Euro country, US is US dollar, so somehow, someone is going to pay US dollars to purchase something that was made in the Euro factory. That creates problems. I'll show you in a minute what sort of problems it creates. Um, to deal with those problems, we hedge those foreign currency exposures. So we, we basically trade foreign currencies with banks. You know banks, they, they send you a bill for it, sometimes you don't even see it. So we pay a lot of hedging costs in order to do that. And to give you an order of a sense of the magnitude that we're dealing with, uh, Philips has external sales of about 18 billion euros a year. The size of the internal flows are three times as much three times 18 billion. That's because of the internal supply chain. And because there are so many flows, there's a lot of foreign currency exposure and a lot of things that need to be hedged. So there's a lot of high level of cost. Um, and uh, there are a lot of different people involved in that as well. And there's a lot of process. So this is a very simplified view of our supply chain for a shaver. This is the factory in Drachten. <coughs> this is the distribution center in the US. They need shavers, they make shavers. Now, what we do is, I'll just tell it as it is. The distribution center, with the help of a regional supply team, they create purchase orders here and there. Because they, they're, they're telling the factory we need 10,000 shares. We need a purchase order. The, the factory then starts to ship those those those, those shares. That's the easy part. There, there the, the shares go in a, in a container in a boat, and they take a couple of weeks to get there. But the financial flows are much more complicated. What the financial flow means is that so purchase order, purchase order shipments of the shavers. There's an entity here in the middle. It's called an entrepreneur entity. This is for tax reasons. Now the factory sells shavers to the entrepreneur. 
And it's all, it's all legal, it's all pre-arranged with tax authorities. They sell the shavers to the entrepreneur for a, for a price of cost, factory cost price plus, plus 10%. So they make 10% profit. The entrepreneur sells the shavers to the, the US distribution center for uh, market price minus 5%. So the difference lands here and that's taxed. That's, it's in the net, that's why. So you will benefit. Uh, so the factory makes 10%, the market makes 5% and the difference is here. That's why you flow these things financially through this entity. So what happens is you have purchase order, purchase order, we send an invoice from the factory to the entrepreneur and the entrepreneur sends an invoice to the distribution center. This is a euro invoice, this is a dollar invoice. This is a euro entity. They sell in dollars. That's an exposure. This is a dollar entity. They buy in dollars. No exposure. That's fine. The old way they used to do it was send purchase order, send purchase order, ship the stuff, send an invoice, wait for a couple of weeks to pay, create exposures, which I will show. The way we do it now is we ship the goods, immediately an invoice is sent, immediately paid, then they send an invoice which is immediately paid. It's an improvement, but it doesn't solve the problem. So, this is, and this is, this is a simple example. There are examples that are much more complicated, especially when we buy things in China, for instance. Here it starts to get uh, technical, so bear with me. Um, this is the way it works today. Again, it's the same flow. It's basically the same diagram. What we do here is, so the factory sends an invoice, let's say a thousand euros, to the entrepreneur. They pay a thousand euros, no issue. Same currency, no issues. However, what happens here is that the entrepreneur sends an invoice to the distribution center, it's two thousand dollars. And here comes the accounting into play. The way it works today is that if you send an invoice today, it's booked at a fixed rate for the entire month. So at the start of the month, start of November, we have fixed a US dollar to euro rate. And whether you send the invoice today, or you send it next week, or you send it on the second day of November, it's always booked at the same rate, this rate, which means this entity records a $2,000 invoice in euros as 1,667 euros. Even if they pay today, they pay against the actual rate of today, the real rate of today, which is 115. So what happens is they pay $2,000. For them, no issue. Invoice payment, $2,000. For the entrepreneur, what, what it means is they thought they were going to get 1,667, they are getting 1,739. That's a 72 euro difference. You might think that's great, they got more than they, that, than what they were expecting, that's right. Um, but in many cases, it's the other way around, it's less than they were expecting. That's what we are trying to hedge against. And the complicated thing is, it's very difficult to hedge because at the start of the month, that's when we set the monthly activity rate, we have to try and guess how many invoices they are going to send so that then we can create a hedge selling those dollars in advance and, and try and protect it. This is, this is very annoying. This is something that is noise in our profit and loss accounts. And the numbers we've published to our shareholders, this is noise. You don't want this noise. This makes our results unpredictable. The solution is that we do exactly the same things, but we start to use daily rates. <coughs> no longer a monthly rate, but a daily rate. So again, we send $2,000 invoice. We use this rate, this rate, that rate, to post it here at the end of the year. And they pay at the same day, same rate, 
same euro rent. No, 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 no gap. It's the same euro rent. So you don't need to hedge it because as long as you make sure that the rate at which, at which the invoice is posted is the same as the rate at which it is paid, you don't have a difference. It's a long story, but we need to try and get that and to understand our case. Why we, we do it in this way currently, it has everything to do with the way our SAP systems have been set up because this is intercompany, which means that every month that they report the numbers, they report the numbers, and they report the numbers, we have to eliminate all of these transactions because they're not relevant for the outside world. They're only relevant for tax authorities and for statutory reporting. You can only do that in the current way we're set up by using one fixed rate for the entire box. It's the only way to do it. This, in theory, could work in SAP. SAP does allow it. It's a complete nightmare because you can never guarantee or enforce even that this posting of the invoice and payment of the invoice is done on the same date against the same revenue. Yeah, but if this all is done internally, why wouldn't I just forgo the issue of money completely and just say I, uh, I will tax it in uh, uh, Philip coin? I don't know. Ah, uh, Philip we'll, points. I don't know. Philip we'll, points. We'll, we'll come to that. That is the, one of the next steps. I mean, <laughs> one of the next yeah, steps. I, I, okay. It's one of the next steps. <laughs> so what, we, what, we, what we're going to do is that <coughs> we're going to do is to prove that by using blockchain technology, we can, we can run this process in such a way that it enforces that all the entity in, entities involved do the same thing, the right thing, at the right moment in time. And it, is, it provides, the blockchain technology provides immutable proof that these transactions have actually happened. And it's just once and not for every entity separately. Um, we've, we've, we've done this, we've built a small proof of concept about a year ago with a few people from our R&D uh, group. They were already working uh, using blockchain technology for something completely different for patient files. I mean, our, our products generate uh, scans of patients and you can file that and if you want to transfer from one hospital to the other, Blockchain seems to be a very good way of, of, of moving it. Um, this is the next stage. What we're going to do is, unfortunately, we cannot step away from SAP. We're, that will take another decade or so, I guess. But it's what we're going to do is build our own internal blockchain using smart contracts to handle the purchase orders and also handle all the invoicing and payments. We've done a previous proof of concept that worked, and we're now going to do it as a layer covering SAP. What, we, what we're trying to achieve is to make sure that everybody posts and acts on the same time, and we record it still in the old traditional individual ledgers at the same time. Does this SAP support your conclusions? Yes. Integrity? Yes. Yes, okay. they do. Um, they didn't know it, but it's it's true. <laughs> uh, we've been working with them uh, okay. to explain this to them yeah, what yeah, we were yeah. trying to do. So they have they have blockchain for SAP. I don't think anyone has used it yet. Uh, I don't think we are going to use it. The, the the interesting part is that you need APIs to talk to let the blockchain talk to traditional SAP. That's what you. And that's what they've, that we've been working with them for the past few months to get that working and develop that. Um, and um, wh why is this important for us? I mean, it's, it's as I said, we, we don't like these foreign currency differences. It's noise, it's, it's expensive to hedge, and um, it's a lot of work for a lot of people, so that, that's 
something as well. So what are, what are the benefits that we're trying to achieve? What we've quantified, the quantified benefit, is that we can stop hedging for unrestricted countries, meaning countries where there are no capital restrictions. You can immediately pay your influence, even if the goods have, even if those shavers have not yet arrived. There are a number of countries, unfortunately, where you can't do that. You need to wait until uh, customs have cleared in uh, your, your products and then you're allowed to pay. But a lot of developed economies allow you to pay as much and when you like. We believe we can save 12 million every year by stopping to hedge for those countries if we implement this process based on blockchain. Um, and that's a start. Uh, I mean, there are, uh, and this is for our personal health business only. We also have health systems business. That is not in, yet in there. Um, the other financial benefits, but we haven't quantified them because that's impossible, is that um, we struggle to make our processes, other processes, more efficient. We still have very traditional processes. And what we're trying to do is demonstrate that by doing this, we can also tackle other processes that are currently very inefficient. Uh, it also allows us to assess how mature SAP is to deal with an external blockchain process. We also believe there are many strategic benefits. Um, you already posed the question. I strongly believe that we should develop a Philips cryptocurrency. It's not cryptocurrency, right? Just no, I mean, it's, points. It's, a, yeah. it's, 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 uh, I mean, Philips is still a very traditional company. We sell boxes. It's, uh, we used to sell boxes with the TV inside it. Today we sell boxes with razors or with MRI scanners. But we, sell, we were selling boxes. Right now we are increasingly selling solutions. We are we sign contracts with hospitals for 25 years and we promise to deliver them with all the equipment they need to run a high-tech hospital. Uh, with the equipment, with the maintenance, even equipment from third parties, not Phillips uh, equipment. And if they pay us $1 million a month, we will do that for, for 25 years. Now, that is already a step away from just selling boxes. The next step is that we're going to sell products based on uh, paper use. Yeah, so light. Put the bottle, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, this is further to about the strategic uh, potential we think it has. There, there's, there's a very clear, we think the very clear financial benefits from this particular case or not. Um, but we strongly believe that there are there is much more potential beyond this, this particular uh, proof of concept. Um, and um, I mean we are located located on the same floor as our the team that handles taxes and they they they've we've shown them this and they go for a while because one of the things they are faced with is that Across that supply chain, they have to prove to tax authorities in the US, in the Netherlands, and wherever it is, that these transactions are linked. And you can't really do that very well in SAP across currents. That's very difficult. It's a lot of work. Uh, if you have a blockchain with transactions recorded for all of those uh, individual uh, supply chain transactions, you have a perfect audit trail uh, that you can use. There, there are many more uh, benefits to believe. Uh, we had to explain, and we still have to explain to our CFO why we cannot do that just in SAP as it is. Uh, and why would we would want to do this based on blockchain? Um, that's the simple story is that in theory SAP can handle it, but in real life it, that's simple then we, if we would want to uh, run an internal supply chain based on daily FX rates, we would have to completely redesign our SAP card. All of them. 
including our consolidation system. Because we need to ensure that interlocking tra transactions every month are eliminated without any issue. There are, so, there are millions of internal transactions. If you cannot eliminate 1% of that, it's a nightmare. It's a complete nightmare. So, yes, in theory, SAP could do it using blockchain. We believe that we, we have a better tool to enforce the timely and correct execution of the transactions at the right rate. Transactions are, are posted in the traditional SAP ledgers. We can do that in SAP itself with run books and robotics, <coughs> it's, and you don't get the same level of synchronization as you would get with, with this. Yeah. I see another question in the audience. I'm going to take inventory. Are there any more? No? Okay, final question from the audience. Hans. Hi, thanks for this nice insight into uh, for keeping the um, problems with that. Um, I was wondering, if you, you, only, you post transactions in SAP using the smart contracts, yeah. is there actually a money flow also? Yes. But isn't that uh, maybe a bit different than the transactions you post? It? So you still have a, a, it's, no, a risk to hatch? That's a good question. What we what I haven't shown you that there is there is another party involved in the game. Uh, it's me. Uh, I'm, tre <laughs> I'm the treasury of right. Philips, so I'm I'm always in, in the middle of every money flow. Uh, we have the treasury set up that, that it's called the in-house bank. So every Philips entity, all those 800, have an account with me, at least one account. And so if. <coughs> The US entity wants to pay the entrepreneur. They send me an instruction to pay from their account to the account of the... And it's all internal money. It's all internal money. Oh. That's right. So, uh, it's all internal money. Uh, and but it's very efficient. In, in, in our in-house bank operation, we can settle intraday every time at any rate. So, it, it allows us to... to Pull together all those flows in the different currencies and only trade with the outside world the net balance of those coins. So if if uh, if the US entity pays two thousand dollars to the Netherlands Euro entity, uh, 
they get $2,000, but they may have to pay dollars to a, a factory in, in China. Now, we trade only to them. Final question before I'm going to give you a big plus, and we're all going to give you a big plus. Philips cryptocurrency, when will it happen? What's the time frame here? Oh <laughs> yeah. well, I hope within the next five years, or sooner. Uh, it's, uh, I think we should build a currency based with, with an underlying basket of main hard currencies that we can use to initially settle transactions between Philips entities, but hopefully also sell them to our customers. Well, it's great news, so all oh, give Gabriel a big applause. Thank you very much. And we're now getting to the final part. It would be the pitches, so I would ask everybody for the pitching floor to line up here. Uh, please, and uh, Jorim, you know who you are. Um, and I think we're going to start off with Jorim because I have his slides here. And I would really ask you to go very quickly to it.
for example, the, the AHEC crisis a couple of years ago, this, this bacteria or the fipronil, fipronil case a couple of years ago, a couple of months ago. They all cost a lot of money. They, I think the, the food waste uh, alone is, is about an intense of millions of dollars. Um, so the case here, the, 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 the problem here is mainly uh, complexity of global supply, global food supply. So we don't know where our food comes from uh, that we buy and, and sell. Um, uh, so um, I'm here with a bit, a bit of a, a double role here. I'm, I'm, made, I'm working till you know, but I have, I'm already I'm working one day a week now as a, trying to spin out of the TNO together with one of my colleagues. And we're working on a platform to uh, facilitate uh, uh, global supply chain traceability and transparency. And we're looking for uh, use cases. So that's basically uh, uh, you mentioned one. Okay. So we're looking for a use case. We already have one, which is basically uh, legal cannabis in the Netherlands. Uh, it's an interesting one, we're looking for more, uh, if you have one, uh, feel free to come to me. Can you share a funny question? Food use cases or just use, use cases in general? Uh, food use cases, preferably. Uh, in that case, Lange, Wageningen is also, yeah. Very good. Yeah. In that case, thank you very much for your pitch and Hans, the floor is yours. One minute. Yeah, thanks. Hello, everyone. Um, we're here usually to talk about food and probably as sustainable as possible. There's another thing that we'd like to have as sustainable as possible. This is our energy. Um, on the 26th and 27th of November in Brussels, there's a conference uh, about flexible energy. Uh, this is usually solving the problem you know, between uh, the demand and the supply of energy, which is changing now because we have solar panels and we have windmills and stuff. And there's also a, a big blockchain track that, that uh, is provided by a company that is experimenting now with blockchain, training energy, uh, predicting demand and supply, and using blockchain. Um, so I, if you have the time and the ability to come to Brussels, it's surely interesting. There are some student uh, tickets available, but it's not a free conference. But if you uh, if you'd like to join, uh, please contact me and we'll see if I can get you a spot over there. If you're a student and if not, just Pay a, lot, pay a bit of money and you will be there and enjoy it. And well, there's nice food in Brussels, so maybe another reason to come. Uh, thank you all. I want to invite back to the stage Tran because he also has something to pitch. Well, pitching. Um, I just wrote a book on cryptocurrencies, which is called Crypto for Victor for Dummies, which is a Unifor Dummies series. Um, but we're, we were just talking about it this afternoon and then we were talking about we might actually need a book or more books on different subjects um, which contain cryptocurrencies, uh, blockchains and different worlds and combine them together. It's, it's, it's like a loose canon project but I think we need more understanding within the whole ecosystem which is so broad and has so many possibilities but also so many caveats. So. Um, if you think you might know anyone who has very specific knowledge about a certain track, maybe uh, maybe food itself, um, well, feel free to contact me. Thank you. It is, of course, almost time to buy your Christmas and Cinderblast presents, so keep it in mind. And I'm going to give the floor to Chris. Hi. Uh, so, hi, I'm Chris. You might know me as the uh, IT guy. Uh, but actually, I'm, I'm, I'm just a volunteer in that. I also have a paid job. Um, <laughs> surprise! <laughs> surprise! So uh, I'm, a, I'm a blockchain trainer, and I also am a blockchain trainer at the Fork, and we help uh, initiatives to get out uh, the ground. Basically, I'm not alone. Hans, Mark, and many others. Okay. Anyway, so if you want to learn more about blockchain in general, uh, be it technological or business. Come and have a training with us. We we do our best, and we try to make the best experience of it. Uh, I'm also uh, a normal teacher in programming, and I even brought one of my students with me today. Okay, big applause for the swimming team. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'm hoping to bring more of them uh, to make them uh, interact with uh, with blockchain. They're very interested. They have no clue what it is. So. Uh, uh, 
they just know it's, it's money, you know, money, make money. Um, so yeah, I'm hoping to see more of that, and I'm very eager to yeah yeah I'm very eager to read your book about that. Maybe I can uh, yeah your book of course though. Borotalk, Borotalk. Borotalk. Okay. Anyway, need training? Come see me. Forty-four. And before you go into your drinks and you need to ask burning questions, I'm going to close down. And here, of course, we have a nice scannable QR code if you want to follow Chris's. Training, and I was told to pause a bit for the QR codes to give you all some time because we have another one. This goes to our YouTube channel. Yeah, we're very into QR codes at the moment, and our YouTube channel needs 100 subscribers before we can have a nice custom made URL with the fork in it. So please like and subscribe. I feel like a blogger now. So, yeah, YouTube, and of course, I want to announce when I'm going to see you all again, or at least I hope to see you all again, and that would be December 11th, and then we will have the year in blockchain. We will look back at the year and see what happened in blockchain in food, and we have several nice guest speakers, amongst others, Fox van Diepen from RVO, so I'm really looking forward to seeing you all, you all again. And before I get to uh, release you to the bar, I would really like to thank you all for being here. Thanks again to our speakers and our panelists. And one, as we say in Dutch, huis houdelijke mededeling. Please leave your plastic badge at the door. We like to save the environment. Thank you very much and enjoy the bar.